Welcome to Education Futures Reads. I'm John Morbeck. I'm Kelly Morbeck. And we are live on Facebook today. So hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, today, we are discussing Lisa Murphy's book, Play, The Foundations of Children's Learning by, believe it or not, Lisa Murphy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's our book for discussion today. And We've been reading this, and Kelly has been reading it very intensely. She's got flags in, and it almost looks like a flower uh, blooming around it. But um, I think it was uh, a little provocative. I think I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I really enjoyed this one. So this book was chosen because there's a lot of research on the benefits of early childhood education. Um, but I thought it would be really nice for us to look at specific practices that we might want to get into as, uh, as educators uh, for to enhance learning at this age level. But I think that we also learned that a, lot of, that a lot of the ideas discussed in the book apply to all age levels as well. Right. And I think, you know, as I'm reading it, I don't have an early childhood background. Um, and so I'm always reading it through my lens of uh, K-6 and K-12. And so, you know, everything that I'm reading, I'm trying to think about how it applies to my setting and my students um, anyway. So I don't know that it's necessarily intuitive, um, but I think if you're willing to make the, the leap from what she's saying through the early childhood frame, uh, you can apply it to any level, really. I think even up to adults. Right. And... Lisa's book is, I think her message is very clear and it's not, it's not that, that far out there. Uh, so we didn't bring in like, like tough questions to, to really discuss. We've got some questions like that we'll discuss, but um, we thought we'd just bring this forward uh, to everybody on Facebook through a seminar type format. So uh, please feel free to add your comments, your thoughts, your questions, your ideas um, in the chat box here. And we're going to monitor as closely as we can and, uh, and feedback and respond back uh, with what you're saying. Cool. So I've never been a teacher before, mm -hmm. obviously. And a lot of what's in this book is kind of new territory for me. So. I so for me going through the first half of the book was kind of like okay so why was she how did she develop her perspective and the second half is more on the more practical side of things and bringing things um, making things real mm -hmm. and that was rather fun mm -hmm. I think so what are some of the key issues that emerged in this book um you know I think a lot of what she talks about in the, this book so we're looking at lisa murphy's the foundation of or play the foundation of children's learning not there uh, <laughs> um and as far as issues i mean i don't know that she necessarily brings up issues other than the importance of play um really the the book is sort of framed around her experiences as an early childhood educator uh, starting out in her very first roles in um you know center type settings where you know as a new newly graduated uh, person uh, with new credentials she comes in and has all these great ideas and she's meeting people who are implementing the same lesson plans they've implemented year after year after year um, that aren't necessarily doing what she had learned or what she uh, just intuitively knew was best for kids and so eventually started her own uh, her own childcare facility, I guess, in her own home. Um, and rather than really being structured, she kind of just set things up for kids to do on their own and then took copious amounts of notes, um, observed for what they were interested in and what they were playing with, and then made sure to set things up the next day based on what she was noticing about the kids. And so basically this book sort of came about as a compilation of all of these notes that she took and things that she recognized as being what was good for kids. I like that she suggested that we all do the same and we all keep a binder, um, which she said was defense against the naysayers that say, well, what evidence, what evidence do you have to uh, support this or why are you doing that? And keeping a binder of all the evidence that you collect. And I think that's a nice idea. Mm -hmm. um, 
For me, I think that the the key issue that emerged in the book, if I could put the book into some sort of nutshell, is that uh, it's really about enabling kids to be kids, to be themselves, um, and not just with these kids at the early childhood level, but also with teachers and free for teachers to be who they are as well, um, to provide better uh, experiences that are more authentic and connecting more naturally with how people learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the things that she talked about in here that I actually just was leafing through my notes that I took and my all my flags. Um, and I probably won't be able to find it right offhand, but where she talked, it was about um, it was about trust and the idea of trusting that kids will do what they. Oh, here. Oh, I just found it. Um, about trust and about relationships. So what she wrote was. Um, well, trust is a topic worthy of its own in-depth investigation for the time being, let it suffice to say that there is no trust, that if there is no trust, there are no relationships. And if there are no relationships, there is no program. Um, and that's something, you know, part of my role uh, in, in my job is to work with student teachers. And that's um, one of the things that I stress the most with them is building the relationships with students and how vital that is to you know, knowing the kids that you're working with so that you can provide them with what they need when they need it. Uh, just as a reminder, folks, we are discussing Lisa Murphy's Lisa Murphy on Play, The Foundation of Children's Learning. Now, you don't have to have read the book to join the conversation, uh, but we do uh, remind folks and invite folks to join in by posting comments or discussion points in the Facebook uh, discussion box. Um. So one of the things that I liked is that she defines very, quite early on is that she encourages early child professionals and teachers to incorporate seven practices into their interactions with children every day. So it's kind of like seven pillars of, um, of child development. It's focused on creation, movement, singing, discussion, observation, reading, mm -hmm. and play. Mm -hmm. Play, I think, is the most fun part. Right. It's my favorite part. But she does say in the book, she does talk about having these seven sort of keys or pillars, um, but, but she talks about play as not being separate from those other six, that, that while she lists it out as a seventh pillar, it really is intertwined with everything else that's happening. So it's playful creation, playful movement, um, you know, singing through play, you know, things like that. So it's really being intentional about embedding the creativity and the movement and singing discussion observation and reading and in such a way that 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 kids are um playing with those concepts or playing around them or at least having opportunities to be freely exploring within those right and my take is that none of this is new no uh it, at least in early child education or elsewhere the education futures reads discussions we've also connected on with uh, peter gray's um uh, free play ideas um but i think that where lisa murphy really adds value is on on advocating for these things and saying quite succinctly why um i think it's also provides a bit of a pushback against the the so-called academicness that we're starting to see in early childhood education. Um, you know, get kids prepared for kindergarten and kindergarten is getting kids prepared for for college and you know she does jobs and yeah. You know. Yeah. She talks about that. That was one of the other things that I marked in here is that every level is the the pre preparation for the next level. So just like what you said, you know, kindergarten is or preschool preparing for kindergarten, kindergarten preparing for the rest of elementary, elementary for middle, middle to high school, high school to college, and then college to career. Mm -hmm. So this whole educational journey is really, it's not focusing in on the journey itself. It's focusing in on how it's preparing you for the next step. Um, and getting back to your point about, you know, the, the academic piece, um, and the idea that these concepts that she's discussing, they're not they're not new. But the problem is, or the, the difference, I think, in Lisa Murphy's ideas comes in the idea that it should be free play and that you're embedding free play in these other pieces. And I think that, you know, when you're looking at preschool as preparation for kindergarten and then if you go on down the line, preparation for career, um, I think there's a tendency to be more focused in on the academic parts and less on 
trusting our students to or our children to be doing what they need to do in the time that they need to do it to be prepared for those. Um, so an example that she gives, um, she she never included reading in her or reading or writing really in any of the the stations that she had set up for kids. She had outdoor stations, indoor stations. And some of her, her, the kids in her preschool came to her and said, we want you to teach us how to read. And she said, no, no, I don't, we're not going to do that. We're not going to sit down and do formal reading or anything. Go play, go play. Mm -hmm. And they kept coming back day after day. No, we teach us how to read because they really enjoyed, you know, the story time and you know, like that. And so she said, okay, well, what do you want to learn how to read? And so from there, she developed with the students these lists of words that they wanted to learn how mm -hmm. to read. And so that on little index cards, and most of them were things like, mom and dad and brother and one had baby because there was a new baby in the house and one was really interested in like samurais or something so he had words like sword and blood and stuff like that like not sight words that any traditional preschool or kindergarten program would teach but then the kids would self-directed sit down at this little table that they had decided was the reading table and get out their cards and play with them and so then they were wanting words, and, um, I don't remember the term that she used for them, but, con oh, connector words. So words like is and the and things like that. So they had their base words that were the words they wanted to read, and then they would combine them across the table and make sentences. And they're teaching one another these sentences and things. And so they, it was all based on what they wanted to do, what they wanted to learn, how they wanted to read, how they wanted to do it. And she was just sort of standing back facilitating as they were engaging in these learning activities with one another. Um, and I think that's kind of the difference between what we're seeing now with early childhood, where's it, where it's this big push for academics um, versus sort of this natural tendency for kids to develop what they need to develop at the time when it's good for them. Right. Um, and that's really what the whole focus of this book is, is that it's not, it's that these kids are fully prepared or I still can't find the camera. They're fully prepared for kindergarten. In fact, she talks in, in the story that shares a vignette about a teacher who, um, a kindergarten teacher who called her and said, what are you doing? All of your kids are coming to us knowing how to read and we want to be able to do the same things you, that you're doing. And, um, you know, and she's not a trained literacy specialist. She's not a reading teacher. Um, but yet her, her kids were learning how to read because they were interested. They decided when they were ready. Very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, Wim Broxma. Hi, Wim. Um, good to uh, hear from you again. Uh, he writes, play seems to be a form of learning without dysfunctional fear, which makes it a free, a free flow process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great statement. <laughs> <laughs> what more we agree. We, what, what more can we say? Um, and I, I want to, I think that, you know, getting back to this, to this, uh, free form function, um, I think that play together with the other six modes uh, that were pillars that she's talking about, I think that these are very natural modes of human learning mm -hmm. um, rather than these sort of uh, forced or unnatural modes right. that yeah. I think we've been getting through this, this uh, so-called uh, push for academics. Right, right. The, the difference between student-directed and adult-directed. Yeah. Um, so I think connecting with this a bit, um, Lisa seems to be really tough on teachers. She seems to be very rough on teachers. And I got the sense that she basically makes most of the teachers out there seem like repressors. Yeah. Is, is that really fair? There, yes. I mean, I think we had this conversation a little bit before how there were some parts in the book, because as I'm a teacher, um, that, that were not offensive to me, but, but yeah, I got my hackles up a little bit, I guess, because, um, I think they're with, I think with, with people who are doing really progressive things, uh, there's a tendency to not necessarily see that you've got colleagues out there or peers out there that think the same ways as you do. And so mm -hmm. their focus on kind of the worst, um, of the opposition and so there's a lot of that kind of implication in the book that sort of in general, everyone is what she called a laminated lady, um, which is a, a, a teacher who has lesson plans from years and years and years ago that are laminated and they just pull those out when it's week three and then week four, it's a different set of laminated lessons. And um, 
And that, you know, in, in my experience as a teacher and in my experience as, you know, someone who goes to lots of different schools, lots of different areas in the United States, I don't necessarily see that. I do see that sometimes. There definitely are laminated ladies still out there, but that's not mostly what I see. Um, and so that, you know, struck a nerve a little bit with me, just a little bit, that, that sort of underlying tone that, um, you know, teachers out there are, like you said, what did you say? Repressive. Repressive. Yeah. <laughs> but the, That's not me. <laughs> that yeah, teachers are, that the teachers are repressors, or the idea of the laminated lady, I think, also reflects this idea that that how we teach children doesn't need to ever change, right. or content, a curricula never needs to change, or time doesn't change, ideas don't change, people don't change. Yeah. And I thought that was um, really tough. Um, I think that another piece that was really interesting related to that is that she said that art has become a receipt for child care mm -hmm. ouch <laughs> right yeah. I, everybody likes to receive art from from the little kids but um you know i think you do the first few times but then like i have tubs literally tubs under our bed full of brennan's my daughter's old artwork from preschool all the way up through when i stopped collecting it what to do with it um i don't want to throw it away because i want to honor her good work but it's sitting under the bed in a tub oh, no. <laughs> but yeah i think you know lisa murphy talked about this idea that you know we do art so that we have something tangible to show look we learned today here it is um, one of the things that she talks about in here, and I actually mentioned to mentioned it to one of my colleagues uh, as I was reading it, is um, not it, it, the idea of you know art as a receipt, but also this idea that the teacher shows you what the piece of art should look like, mm -hmm. and then the students copy it. Mm -hmm. And I've definitely seen that as um, you know someone who goes around in different school buildings, particularly in the elementary buildings, seeing you know all down one hallway the identical owl, um, because that's that was what the teacher modeled, so that must be what is correct. Right. Um, and so that kind of gets away from, you know, Lisa Murphy's idea of art, which is play with the art supplies, be creative, and maybe there isn't any sort of piece that you have to take home as a, as a way to show, yep, I learned today. Right. Um, it's the process over the product. Right. And Wim is being a bit of a provocateur uh, today, I believe. He said, teachers have too much ego. I don't know. Is it about ego or is it? Um, I, th I think, I don't know that I'd say ego necessarily, That, but I, th I think the spirit of what Wim is suggesting is probably true. That, um, you know, there's this idea I think some teachers have you know, I taught it, so you should have learned it. That's a little bit of that ego base. I don't know. I think maybe uh, adult-directed uh, learning, or not even learning, adult-directed teaching, adult direction, maybe is kind of bordering on that same concept, right? So it's, um, you know, the, the adult is in charge of developing the lesson plans. The adult is in charge of teaching the lesson plans. The adult is in charge of assessing whether or not the student's Learn what they were supposed to learn. So there isn't much self-direction in there for the students. And so the students don't have any choice to be creative in a system like that because there's a very specific product or outcome that they're meant to produce as a result of whatever they've done in class that day. And it's all directed by the adult. Um, I don't know that it's so much ego, but it's definitely that adult-driven um, sort of instruction. Well, to me, it, I think it's... From the it's a reflection of this mentality that I think we have adopted that we assume that kids will not learn anything unless if we tell them what to learn. Yeah. And really nothing can be further from the truth. And that the only thing that kids do is learn. They learn it through play, they learn it through singing, they learn it through through uh, creative work. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. So okay, so I, I know you have some things written that you wanted to talk about, but you posted something on Facebook yesterday. Um up that it was something like um, we we focus a lot on lifelong learning, but not on lifelong play. Why is that, or something something like that? Right. Did you see what I commented? Uh, I did. I don't remember though. 
Oh. Oh. Hmm. What did you say? I said, I think that's because it's impossible not to be a lifelong learner. You can't help but learn. Our brains are wired for learning. We learn all the time, whether we recognize it or not. But being playful and playing, and if we, we can exchange the word play for free exploration or, you know, something like that, that's not something that we necessarily do all the time. Um, and I think that as we grow older, really from childhood, really once you start kind of that, the, the schooling, K in kindergarten and, and on up, um, play is looked at as optional and not as important as the work that you're doing in school or the work that you're doing through your job or career, right? And so play, I think, is um, not something that is that everyone is doing all the time. I think that we, we tend to, let's say we, we beat out the will to play, the desire to play in children so that, I don't know why. I don't know. I don't agree with that. I don't it, think we beat it out. I think we fact, just don't provide time for it. Factories and armies and, um, and many businesses maybe do not want playful people. But I think that's changing, um, especially now we're seeing a huge growth in, um, you know, business leaders and what they're looking for in future employees is, you know, creativity and the ability to, to think outside the box and problem solving um, and things like that. And there's a definitely a playful nature that comes with some of those characteristics. Right. And I think that also when we play, um, a lot of what when we play the outcomes cannot be are not as easy to prescribe. It's hard to say what we learn or what we will learn through play. And I think that that this control or elimination of play is also reflective of lack of trust. Mm -hmm. um, and Lisa Murphy argues that lack of trust kills creativity. Mm -hmm. So if we want to be more creative, we want more creative people. Maybe we should think about playing more. Yeah. So whose needs are being met then when we eliminate play? Uh, the students or the teachers? I mean, I would argue that no one's needs are being met. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, folks. Again, uh, we are discussing Lisa Murphy's Lisa Murphy on Play, the foundation of children's learning. Uh, you don't need to have uh, read the book to join the conversation on Facebook, uh, but... We're inviting everybody to uh, post comments in the comment box and join the conversation on play and six other valuable pillars uh, in early childhood education, which I think that we can argue apply to all ages. Yeah. So she really struck me um, with a, a great... Uh, comment that one size fits all policies should not be applied to teachers the same way that they should be that they should not be applied to children because I really love that because we've been advocating while well, we don't you know one size fits all curricula for children or approaches for children are pretty rotten ideas but she's also saying for teachers um, and that's you know I think quite a bit of an attack on the industrial model and I think that furthermore that if we treated teachers as professionals why, why would we even have a one-size-fits-all model? And I think that this gets back to the conversation on teachers as professionals and appreciating and treating teachers as professionals um, to enable, enable everybody to do the best and best jobs that they can. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think that goes back to that, the control, right? Right now, particularly in um, this era where it's high stakes testing and there's all these accountability measures put into place um, and kind of forced on teachers and students, uh, the people in charge, be that the principal or uh, superintendent, you know, the, the, at the district level or even at the state level, want to have some way to ensure that students are learning what they're supposed to know and understand and be able to do by the end of kindergarten, by the end of first grade, by the end of second grade, by the end of high school, so that they're prepared for college. Um, and so what happens as a result of that is, you know, we've got these tests that students are supposed to pass to show that they are able to do the things that schools have said they're able to do. Right. 
And then we have curriculum that is built and sold around making sure students pass these tests. And then we have um, schools or districts that are per that purchase this curriculum and say, okay, here, this is what you have to do. And and teachers are sort of stuck in this place where, well, I either do do this and, and implement this, or I do maybe what I think is better for kids and possibly, probably produces better test results. Um, but because that's not the sanctioned curriculum or that's not the sanctioned process or procedure, then I, I am seen as, you know, someone who is making waves or I'm um, disciplined uh, for not, you know, doing what everyone else is doing. And that's a little bit of what happened with Lisa Murphy and her story. She was wanting to, you know, go outside the box and do sure. some of these great things that she knew about and she just intuitively felt were, were better for kids and um, was basically told, no, you, you need to stop that. Here are the laminated lesson plans. This is what we do this time of year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that. All right, so I've got another area of conversation directed at you, Kelly, okay. because you are the internationally recognized literacy expert in, in the room here. Um, <laughs> out of the two of us. <laughs> all, the two, all the two of us right. and, and, and the cat, like. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was like, oh my God, she advises against doing more work through reading and writing as punishments. Mm -hmm. Like we said to kids, you know, go sit down and read a book. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was like, whoa, we're treating reading and reading as a punishment. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Is, it, is this yeah, something that really emerges? And I mean, Yes, are you kidding? Yeah, because, you know, reading and writing are, are, are quiet. Yeah. Um, if you're reading and or writing you're in theory not causing any sort of behavior just distraction mm -hmm. for other kids yeah i mean we've all seen the beginning of the simpsons right where bart got in trouble and he's writing a thousand sentences on the board yeah that's l using literacy as a punishment taking away recess and forcing someone to go to the library and read that's using literacy as a punishment don't do that <laughs> that's the best way to kill anyone's love of reading or writing okay so what should we be doing instead um, giving kids access to lots of high quality text that they're interested in and um, allowing them to read toward their curiosities and toward their interests and reading and writing in authentic ways for authentic audiences and purposes. Okay. Lots and lots and lots. Lots and lots and lots. <laughs> <laughs> lots of opportunities, but not so much the top down direction. Right. Maybe. Okay. All right. So... Little kids love to move around. They, yeah, they love to move. They love to run. They love to. I, I so yeah, they love those things. But I also they need to do those things. And they need to do that. Mm -hmm. And she says that when children are deprived of places where they can engage in developmentally appropriate large motor physical feats, they will start doing them in the classroom. Yeah. And this time, this often gets interpreted as or misinterpreted as behavioral problems right did you i posted a funny video on facebook the other day it was a satire but it was about um everything that's wrong with the with the direction education is moving did you see that no, i missed that. and the, so the guy kind of explains this kind of futuristic idea of where we want to go with education and um the the person interviewing him says oh no here's all the reasons why that's wrong the human body bends at the waist and the knees so that you can sit at a desk all day long. Right. Right. <laughs> so it was just, I like it was a satirical <laughs> video. And, but I mean, I think that's, that's kind of, that's what we're doing. And someone else, a completely different thing on Twitter this morning, I read said something about how ridiculous is it that we want to take away screen time at home, right? We're going to mm -hmm. take away Minecraft and solve all the problems because kids are sitting for too long, sedentary, playing Minecraft or doing whatever on their computer. But that's what we're forcing them to do for the majority of their day at school. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll make sure they don't do what they want to do and, you know, be a little bit more sedentary at home. That self-directed, you know, right. learning. But at school, all bets are off because we want them all sitting silently in their seats, bending at the waist and knees all day long. So what about the fidget craze? Mm -hmm. We've got here a fidget spinner. I haven't quite figured the, the stuff out yet, but 
The kids. You're this is this, is this is kind of this is kind of like a like like micro movements in the classroom, mm -hmm. in a way. And rather than running around, I could fidget around by holding on to something that spins in your hand. Mm -hmm. How about that? It seems that there's a lot of pushback against fidget devices. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Okay. So th this fidget spinner, um, and lots of other fidget things. There's putty. There, there are the cubes. Um, there are just, you know, it's really something that someone who maybe struggles with anxiety or struggles with, uh, you know, hyperactivity that needs to have something else going to be able to really focus on and attend to some other task, right? That was the purpose of this. That's why these were, um, you know, developed and why they've been okay for kids to bring to school, right? Sure. Because it was to, to, to meet that need for the few kids that, have it that you know need to quell anxiety or this need for focusing on something to be able to attend to something but what's happened is lots of kids now are bringing spinners to school and it's not really different than the pokemon cards and the slap bracelets and the rubik's cubes and all the other things the difference though is that because this started out as a tool for students there's more it's almost um uh, acceptable, I guess, for students that don't necessarily need it for its intended purpose to still have it in class. Mm -hmm. And so my take on it is, this is like a $5 piece of plastic. If you've got kids that would rather do this than attend to whatever it is that you're offering for them as the teacher, you may need to rethink what you're asking kids to do in your class. Because... Why on earth would you want to focus on this if there was something better to be focusing on? If you don't need this as a tool to help you focus, sure. but you're choosing to focus on it over whatever activity is being presented to you in class, then that means that this thing is more engaging than that thing. So as a teacher, you have to figure out how to be more engaging. Figure out what it is, and that goes back to that relationships piece, and it goes back to the, the, what I talk with my student teachers about. Number one is relationships, building relationships with kids, knowing your kids, mm -hmm. being able to recognize when they've tuned out, whether it's because you can actually visibly see this or because you can just see their cues, and then also knowing what they're interested in, what they're good at, and being able to develop your lesson plans um, so that they're able to experience those things in an authentic way, right? Because if kids are engaged in something that they're really interested in and they get to choose it and they, they get to figure out what the process is and what the product looks like, they're not going to be playing with this. They might have it under their desk and using it as it was intended if there's someone that needs it to focus. Right. I think that, and we also see, you know, teachers working with older kids run into similar things with cell phones in the classroom or laptops or devices in the classroom mm -hmm. that if the teachers aren't competing with those, then if the kids are learning other stuff through right. these devices, then why worry? Right. They're, like my friend, good friend Jane Lascarbo says, she just said it the other day, kids are paying attention. They just might not be paying attention to what it is you want them paying attention. So, Wim asks another really good question. Do kids play with their natural gifts? I, I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. I think when, when we are focused on play, and particularly free play, that we're exploring our gifts and our passions um, in ways that are meaningful to mm -hmm. us, uh, rather than, say, directed play or, or sports or something, mm -hmm. maybe. But yeah, yeah, I'd say very much. And I think. That's a comfortable space when you're exploring something that you already have a natural gift with or something that you're interested in or something that you have an aptitude for so that you can push boundaries and take risks because you're already feeling a sense of comfort because that's an area that's meaningful to you somehow. And again, we're talking about Lisa Murphy's Lisa Murphy on Play, the foundation of children's learning. Um, we're inviting folks to join in by posting comments on Facebook and the comments box that uh, accompanies this video. Um, and you don't need to have read the book, uh, but really curious about, um, I suppose, play. Bringing some more free play and uh, less direction within the classroom, particularly within early years. Mm -hmm.
So she wrote that engaging the senses or knowing when to shut up and stop being so prescriptive as teachers. Mm -hmm. And I like that she had, you know, she was saying, you know, we need to take time to listen, we need to take time to look, we need time to smell as teachers, but also as students and say, you know, to really, to really listen to your, your senses and get the integration, slow down, yeah. take time to observe and becoming more comfortable with silence to allow kids to learn themselves. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really interesting because in modern society, we don't, we get really, really nervous and upset if we have silence. Yeah. I, I think culturally in the United States, we can handle maybe about four seconds of silence before we go crazy in a conversation. Yeah. Well, and, do you remember what happened to me yesterday when I got in the car? So I, I got in the car to drive. I had a pretty long distance to go and my speakers didn't work. I couldn't get any sound at all on the radio, on AM or FM. I couldn't get any sound coming through my phone. There was no sound at all. And I drove for about, I don't know, what, 15 miles um, before John said, turn off the pullover, turn off the car, and turn it back on. And that eventually worked. But that 15 minutes, I didn't know what to do with myself. Yeah. Just, you know, in the car. And... I kind of sang a little bit to myself and I talked a little bit to myself, but I mean, I was feeling that silence and that really did feel uncomfortable to me. And I think that was kind of eye opening in that, you know, we, we really should be able to just sit and listen or stand and listen or walk around, listen, observe, smell, you know, all of those things. And I think right now we're, we're in a place where, Everything is at the, the tips of your fingers. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to occupy your visual field with your phone or your device, right? How many people take their phone into the bathroom now these days? Like, gross. But what are you going to do while you're in there? Right? Is that what you do? <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, you know, what, you even have 30 seconds. I know you're on Facebook a lot. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. Now I know. Okay. <laughs> That you just, you can't, but she's right, right? If you think introspectively about all the times when you have the opportunity to just observe when, you know, how often do you fill it with the phone or, mm -hmm. you know, something else? You're filling the silence. Right. And as teachers, um, they're also role models for kids. And kids do look at teachers as, as role models. Oftentimes we say, get out of the way, but uh, there's also a need to, to share as much as well. And so Lisa talked about um, thinking out loud mm -hmm. to help role model our thinking. And I think that can sometimes be tough, too. We were at the dog park yesterday, and I was narrating what was going on <laughs> with dogs. And you, you turned around and said to me, what kind of weirdo are you? No, I did not. I said, you're just like Hillel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I narrating said, everything. Narrating everything. <laughs> sharing, thinking out loud and um, yeah, sharing my thinking. So, mm -hmm. But that is not a new concept for teachers. Uh, modeling is part of what, you know, we call it the gradual release of responsibility. So, and that's, you know, the very first part is the teacher modeling um, whatever the strategy is or, you know, whatever it is we want students to, to know and understand and be able to do. Typically, it's in regard to whatever the, the product is. Um, but modeling your thinking is, and especially in literacy and reading, um, you, you, you model what you're thinking as you're reading all the time so that mm -hmm. children can see you're having this conversation in your head with the author, you know, with the characters in the story, um, a as you read and that's what good readers do. So that idea of modeling, that's not new. Right. Um, and then among the, the pillars, uh, there was music. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, that's a really great one. That's something that connects, I think, quite with the quite close to the human soul or the human experience. Yeah. Uh, I saw that you had posted a comment in the book uh, that this was just this is just like UDEC, uh, yeah. European Democratic Education Community. And there was a conference in Poland a couple of years ago where on the stage uh, they planted various musical instruments and noisemakers, and late at night. What happened? Yeah. People of all ages, kids all the way up through adults, jumped up on the stage and just started playing music together, um, including 
Hillel, our son, who got up and did some beatboxing into the microphone. But there were there were percussion instruments, uh, keyboard, guitar, and just, you know, none of it necessarily sounded beautifully musical. Um, I don't know that all of the musicians were trying to play together, um, but they were all just playing. And that made it beautiful. I mean, it was just, it was so fun. And to see, you know, Hillel was, what, 10 at the time? Yeah. Not, you know, kind of shy in a different country where he didn't speak the language, playing with kids that he'd never met before, all of whom spoke different languages. And he jumped up on the stage and started beatboxing into the microphone. And, for, and there were, you know, a huge field of people that were, you know, there, some listening, some not. But, you know, for him to be able to take that risk... I thought that was really cool. Very nice. Mm -hmm. So, Kelly, what do you think children would love most in school? Um, gosh, that's a good question. You know, I think about, I had a really interesting conversation, oh, it's been quite a while ago, but with someone who um, felt that she wasn't a real teacher because she just taught um, in a 4-H program. And... You know, we had we talked about the idea that, you know, the, the students that are coming to the 4-H program, they're there by choice. Um, and typically, they're excited to be there. They've got projects that are important to them that they're working on that they're displaying for an authentic audience at, you know, the fair in the summer. Um, and so I said to her, well, if anything, you're you're more of a real teacher providing, you know, real real world and hands-on learning based on creativity and based on curiosity and based on, you know, what students really wanted, want yeah, to know and understand sure. and be able to do. So I think in, in general, uh, a school experience that was more like that, where kids are coming, they're excited to be there, they want to be there, mm -hmm. and they get to spend most of their day engaged in real authentic learning based on their interests, their curiosities, their aptitudes, and, you know, more social, mm -hmm. more opportunities for kids to talk and um, explore, be noisy if they need to, and run, um, and sing, and, you know, then be quiet if they need to. Yeah. Go outside sometime. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, I really thought, I quite a bit on similar lines, uh, but really being on um, having space or to, de to develop the possibility of being uh to, to develop poss possibility of being yourself I and mean, that's especially in early child education but also later years it's where you develop it into and where you're going to be and you've all these possibilities but also possibilities for yourself as well and then to be able to play with those possibilities express those possibilities learn about those possibilities build those possibilities I think that's really what children want most in mm -hmm. school. And I think you just said, you know, figure out what you want to be. And that makes me think of, you know, I think we, you know, we've heard before, we need to stop asking that question. The question we should be asking is what problem do you want to solve um, instead of what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and I think we really even more need to get away from that idea of what do you want to be when you grow up because many people set out to be something and then they change. Um, the nature of their job changes, the nature of their interest changes, the nature of, you know, whatever it is that they know the best or most curious about changes. Who do you want to be? How do you want to be? Right. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, we need to do a better job of, of making sure that we're not pigeonholing someone into a specific job. Um, but, you know, making sure that, that the kinds of questions that we're asking is more holistic around a a, a work right or... oh mm -hmm. all right so we are running uh close to the end of this session but want to just uh, remind folks it's still not too late to join the conversation on facebook uh we are discussing lisa murphy's lisa murphy on play the foundation of children's learning and uh please uh please uh post your comments questions whatever in the, in the comment box and uh, I'll work through those in the next uh, few minutes. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I keep saying so. I'm opening so many things by saying so, so, so I have to stop. So I have to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. um, 
she embraced uh, a few principles that, that we had in Manifesto 15. Is that, that, that was a lens that I used to, to read this book. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first principle, which is actually number three in the, or number two in the manifesto, kids are people too. Um, I really saw that expressed in this book and that by her saying that kids are experts on their own learning through play. Uh, but my concern is that she focused on the early years only, and perhaps we need to think of more lifelong play. Mm -hmm. So that's why yesterday on Facebook I posted, well, what if we were lifelong players instead of lifelong learners? But I think that I think that's really it. It's not just on the early years, whereas I mean the early years are super critical, but we need to I think uh, focus on this uh, throughout life. Mm -hmm. So why do adults look down on play as she suggests? Are we not getting enough play ourselves? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I, I'm i tired sometimes. And I don't want to play. <laughs> I want to sit on the couch and watch TV sometimes. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think part of it is putting so much uh, energy and focus on what you're doing in your job that day or through your career. And, you know, that, that maybe... As adults, we don't necessarily provide space and time for that play anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I think part of that is because of the way that society looks down on play. Like play is frivolous. Like uh, that it's it's not important. That what is important is your work, is your job, is your career. Um, and so I think maybe if there was a, a mindset shift in what what's really important, which is you know being happy, being you know, and that that play might come into play more mm -hmm. um, or at, or at least the the my tendency maybe would be to to shift my thinking toward when am I going to have time to engage in whatever play I was interested in versus when am I going to have time to you know schedule this meeting and write these emails and you know mm -hmm. these observations things like that. Uh, another point that I thought that really connected the manifesto is the fourth point which is the thrill of jumping off a cliff by deciding to do so yourself is a high you will never have if someone else pushes you off of it. Mm -hmm. And so that she was really advocating for allowing kids to learn themselves through self-driven experiences and play. Mm -hmm. um, and she wrote, creativity flourishes when activities are done for enjoyment, not when they are forced or coerced. Mm -hmm. And a question that I think that we both have then is how can we transform schools that are support this? Well, I think, you know, like I mentioned before, we need to get away from the, the accountability measures as being the most important aspect of school. Um, because as long as that's in place, play is never going to be at the top of the list of what's important for kids to be doing during the day. Right. And accountability, I think, is a very important thing that at the end of the day, we still need to be accountable. It's yeah. it's a good question. Are we accountable? Are kids learning? And well, why not ask it? It is a fair question. But um, as we said, also the manifesto, we need to uh, measure what we value rather than valuing what we measure. So mm -hmm. I think that in the whole accountability and assessment arena that we really re need to retool all of that. So that we can really connect with uh, what we value so much better, right? So much more. Well, and do all kids need to know exactly the same things at the same age or grade level? I mean, that's absurd. <laughs> <laughs> that just doesn't make any sense at all. No, none of it makes any sense it at just, all. What makes sense about that is that that's the easiest way uh, to to hold teachers and children in schools accountable. Right. It fits people into spreadsheets, yeah. but. I think uh, we've said enough of that. And then the final point in the manifesto that I thought this book really connected with was the 12th point, which is we must and can build cultures of trust in our schools and communities. Because when I got to the end of the book, reflecting back, it's all about trust. It's all about trusting kids to play. It's all about trusting kids to learn. It's all about trusting teachers uh, to provide great experiences. And I thought, I thought that was just a really beautiful part of the book. Mm -hmm. Schools don't want to take chances. They really don't want to take chances. 
But when we don't have trust within our schools or between teachers and students or even the community, having no trust also means that we have no relationships. Mm -hmm. And our relationships and traversing these, these networks of relationships is how we learn. So part of that trust piece is, she said, you know, let go of so much of that control. Don't ask kids fake questions. Like, don't ask kids questions where you know, where the, you know what, the, what the answer is going to be. Ask more authentic questions. Right. That was one of my favorite parts of the book. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. But she um, saw someone, you know, watching children were painting. And the teacher went up to the little boy and said, Oh, what colors are you using? And the little boy said, Oh, everybody, Miss So and So doesn't know her colors. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> but, you know, those are fake questions mm -hmm. and it's creating fake experiences for kids. So stop asking fake questions. Stop asking, stop creating fake experiences because high supervision leads to low creativity, mm -hmm. it leads to distrust and no relationships. Mm -hmm. And much reduced learning, I think yeah. we can argue. Mm -hmm. So here, here's a question then that I have for you based on something similar. So I was I found this article the other day, um, prioritizing free unstructured play may reduce teenage anxiety and depression. Okay. And um, the author is Tracy Gillette. Um, and so, you know, I thought, wow, this really kind of connects to this idea of play, but it's with, with older kids, you know, with teenagers, and then how not having that that unstructured playtime maybe is contributing to their anxiety and depression, which uh, research has been done recently that shows that there's a rise in that with our teenage population. But one of the things that really struck me in here um, was it says, through seeking to protect them, we, d we deprive them, so teenagers, of the freedom they need to nourish their growing minds and replace it with an unhealthy level of adult control, mm -hmm. increasing the odds they will suffer from anxiety, depression, and other disorders. But here's the thing. Like, as a parent, mm -hmm. if I could prevent my children from having to experience something harmful or, or hurtful to them or um, just anything negative, I would want to do that. It would be my instinct to try to protect them. Uh -huh. And I think that sometimes that gets in the way of allowing our kids to experience free play because as adults we know what might happen if someone climbs up to the very tip top of the tree maybe they'll fall and break their arm maybe they'll break their neck maybe something worse sure. um and so we say oh no 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 you can't do that and then it goes to the point where it's you know kids are in knee pads and elbow pads and helmets yeah. so they can go up the three steps and then down the slide that's being extreme but you know, I think we we go overboard a little bit sometimes because we're we want to protect. We don't want to see anything bad, mm -hmm. any sort of harm, any negativity come to our children. And you know, it's that instinct to protect. But then, where where is the line? Where do we allow kids to you know take some risks and experience the the free play or free exploration that they need, and still feel like I don't know. That's hard for me because I don't want to see my children hurt. Or, right. I, and I mean, physically and emotionally. And so, you know, it, I, it's hard for me to get past those instincts to want to say, no, 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 stop. I know better than you about this and not let them have that authentic experience of learning for themselves. You know, if I ride my skateboard at full speed down the driveway, mm -hmm. when I hit the curb, I'm going to fall and skin my knees. Yeah. <laughs> and it's such a critical time in development. And I would also add self-actualization. If you're not provided the space to play and become yourself and actualize yourself, then that can be very depressing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They start to think more entrepreneurially. They start to think more creatively and want to make actions to, um, to do things, but also actualize who they are developing in as well mm -hmm. and through exploration, mm -hmm. which is very playful too. And I think too, you know, as, as we suggest more and more to kids that we as adults know better, mm -hmm. they, as they get older, stop maybe having that natural instinct to play and start having more of an instinct to look toward an authority of some kind um, as they're making decisions. And so we're, we're, training them out of being problem identifiers and problem sure. solvers and mm -hmm. critical thinkers um, as a result of that instinct to protect. 
Well, I'm out of stuff to talk about, and I think we're about out of you? time. I, well. <laughs> yeah. At least for now. Okay. Yeah. And you? I could talk all day. Yep. Yeah. That, that I know. Yeah. <laughs> and you do. All right. Uh, so I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, this recording uh, is going to be posted on YouTube uh, soon, and I believe it's going to be on Facebook for a while as well. And it just may also uh, appear in the Education Futures podcast. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank and, you. And uh, see you next month. We're going to announce a new book because our book for next month, uh, Jennifer Gidley's uh, book on uh, future thinking, has been postponed until September because she wants to join us for the conversation. And I think that's fantastic. So we're making a quick change in the lineup, and we're going to pick something, I think, a bit shorter and mm -hmm. a bit fun as well. So um, see you again in about a month. Bye-bye. <laughs>